Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you're situated, and welcome to the Social Service Workforce webinar series brought to you by the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance and Global Partnerships and Violence Against Children and UNICEF. Um, the Alliance webinar series is funded by the United States um, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, that's commonly referred to as PEPFAR, and the US um, AID to the Four Children Project implemented by a consortium of organizations and led by Catholic Relief Services. The Alliance is also funded by UNICEF. Today's webinar is co-hosted by the Global Partnership to End Violence and UNICEF. I am Catherine Maronowska, and I am the lead for data, evidence, and learning at the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. Um, today's session is the 27th webinar in a series and is on the topic of ending violence against children, which requires, of course, a strong social service workforce. This webinar examines how we can strengthen the social service workforce um, and how it's interwoven into different countries' national plans um, of action to address violence against children and also to simultaneously um, make an effort to address the seven strategies outlined in the INSPIRE package. So we're going to hear quite a bit today about different approaches to this, um, these efforts to end violence. Um, we'll look now at an agenda slide just to give you an idea of what's going to happen um, during today's talk. So we're going to first hear from Howard Taylor, who uh, is the executive director of our organization, the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. And he's going to provide an update on what we're up to at End Violence and an overview of Pathfinder Country's national plans of action and linkages to the workforce-specific um, workforce actions. We'll then, uh, after Howard's done, we'll then hear from Amy Bess, who's the director of Global Social Service Workforce Alliance on recent advocacy efforts undertaken by the Alliance and by many members of the partners that are um, a member to their network. We're then going to move on um, to some case studies and country studies with Nella Kernik from UNICEF Child Protection um, Section. She's an officer in Montenegro country office and she will present on efforts underway in Montenegro to prevent violence and protect children through the strengthening of the social workforce. And then we're going to move slightly south and hear from Sebastian Kitiku, who is head of the Social Services Delivery Policy Forum and officials from the President's Office, Regional Administration and Local Government with the um, Republic of Tanzania. And he will present on the social service workforce strengthening that's going on in Tanzania and um, how this ties into the national plan of action in that country. Then after um, those two case um, country specific um, speakers, we will move to Kristen DiMartino, the senior advisor for child protection at UNICEF, who's going to present to us on UNICEF strategies overall to strengthen the service work workforce, um, social service workforce specific to child protection. So after all the presentations have been done, and given, we'll moderate a question and answer section um, where we'll all be helping, all the presenters will be um, helping respond to your questions. And um, we want to remind you that at any point you can send your questions to the chat box um, during any of the speeches so that you don't forget who you want to ask and what you want to ask. Um, and then we'll address them all at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the um, presentation and microphone as it is over to Howard Taylor, the Executive Director of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Thanks, Cathy, for, for that great introduction. Thanks to the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance for being the prime mover in convening us all today, and particularly to Amy Bess and, and Nicole Brown. And thanks to everyone who's, who's on the webinar today. It's, it's always good uh, when all those of us who are like-minded um, in pursuit of child protection and ending violence against children uh, hang out together on these sorts of webinars, share experiences and learn from one another. So I, I know I will come away inspired by what I'm going to hear um, from you all later, later on the webinar. I'm going to speak, as Cathy said at the start, um, and frame a little context from where we see as the broader end violence e ecosystem is right now, the opportunity that we have ahead, some specifics about where we are in the global partnership with regards to pathfinding countries, and then share a few very headline thoughts uh, about some of the implications of all of that um, for the social services workforce. So next slide, please. Yeah. 
This slide uh, attempts to capture a snapshot of the, the momentum and the opportunity that we feel we have on ending violence against children right now. Starting with the global goals on the top left and going clockwise, we have the North Star of the global goals from three years ago. This week, three years ago, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, including SDG 16 and including within that 16.2, were agreed by 193 heads of government. And that commits 193 governments to end all forms of violence, abuse and neglect against children by 2030. That's a very powerful political tool uh, that we have in, in our toolkit. The End Violence Against Children Solutions Summit, that's the, that's the graphic in the middle at the top with the Swedish flag, hosted by the government of Sweden, We Protect and others uh, in uh, Stockholm earlier this year, um, was the first time that four or five hundred people from around the world, from governments, from academia, um, the media, civil society, faith groups, came together, practitioners, advocates, policymakers, politicians, corporate leaders, um, with a shared interest in ending violence against children. From that event, we've seen um, continuing political momentum, which I'll speak to in a moment. The graphic at the right-hand side is the INSPIRE framework, many of you will be familiar with. Uh, we now no, not just have the INSPIRE framework of, of strategies for ending violence against children, the comprehensive set of strategies for ending violence against children. We also, in July, had the launch of the Handbook for Practitioners, the how-to, uh, to actually not just know what the strategies are, but how do you go about implementing those strategies. Coming down to the, the map um, on, on the bottom right, and I'll share a bigger version of this soon that will be a bit more legible than this one might be, but this is just an indication of the growth in the number of pathfinding countries uh, which we have now seen in the global partnership, and I'll speak to that in more detail. The, the words around and the hashtag Me Too, not specific to children or child violence, but we believe it's indicative of something changing more broadly outside of intergovernmental pro pro processes, uh, etc., where in the general public there is a growing intolerance of unacceptable behaviors which have for too long been tolerated. Um, as I say, Me Too movement isn't about children uh, and it isn't about violence per se, but we think that, sh that, sh that shift and changing of attitudes, we think, could be an incredibly powerful contextual driver of norm change over time, which we can leverage uh, that same intent, that same feeling to end violence against children. And finally, coming to the bottom left graphic, uh, a little picture of 2019, I will speak uh, in a little more detail to this, but again, it's the opportunity we see ahead in the next year um, for some particular moments which can be the backbone of making faster, more significant progress collectively to raise awareness um, of, of end violence against children and getting new commitments. I'll speak more to that. Next slide, please. So this is our strategy, um, and we being the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, we are a secretariat um, which services a member-based partnership. We have almost 300 member organizations and governments now in, in the partnership. And our plan for the next three years is to be focusing really on three broad areas. One is growing demand for change. The second is mobilizing new resources for everyone working to end violence. And the third is equipping practitioners by making sure they have access to the solutions, the expertise and the resources they need to do the work on the ground. And I'll just speak very briefly, not to every piece of information on, on this summary slide, but just to two or three things what, and under, under each pillar. Under Grow Demand for Change, um, I mentioned very briefly the launch of a Safe to Learn campaign, which we with other partners, UNICEF, the British government, UNESCO and others, will be launching at the Education World Forum in January. Um, we see that as a particularly important initiative because schools are a place where children gather or should gather. It's a place where they should be safe, but they're not always safe. It's a place where there is government accountability and there are both specific interventions which we believe can help end violence in schools. At the same time, uh, will also improve learning outcomes for children in schools. But we also know that you can't actually tackle violence in schools without involving the community outside of the school boundaries. So faith leaders, community leaders, parents, caregivers, and others. So we also see the conversation and a campaign around ending violence in schools as a gateway and entry point to prompting a conversation about violence against children more broadly. Under the mobilizing of new resources, a particular piece of work that we have coming up is working with expert individuals and institutions to prepare a seminal piece of work around the costs uh, and the return on the investment of, of ending violence against children. 
And this is to go to do two things. One is to build, to protect and preserve, but build on the rights-based case for ending violence against children and make the smart investment case for ending violence against children. But to do that at a level which is below the very large global aggregate figures which we already have. So figures of 1 billion children experiencing violence, figures of $7 trillion a year of the opportunity costs over the lifetime of those children experiencing violence, they're great, but they don't actually, as far as we can see, um, help practitioners, advocates, policymakers at the national level to make a persuasive evidence-based advocacy case um, for investing in to, to the government and to corporate leaders and others for investing to end violence. So we're hoping that piece of work will get to that second piece, that more detailed national level piece, um, and equip people with some sort of methodology that can be applied locally to, to more persuasively make that evidence-based case um, and mobilizing resources. The third piece, and this is really, um, this, this webinar today is an example of this, the equipping practitioners piece, is just making sure uh, that if we are growing for mark demand for change and we are helping mobilize new resources, that actually it's also definitely making sure that practitioners on the ground have this access to the solutions, expertise, and resources that they need for that work. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a bigger graphic of the one I shared earlier. It shows now that we have 23 pathfinding countries in the global partnership. Um, and to give you a sense of the, the speed of that growth, we had 13 countries, pathfinding countries at the beginning of this year. We had 15 pathfinding countries in February at the time of the Stockholm Solutions Summit. Um, and now we have 23. So we have pathfinding countries coming, joining the partnership uh, at a rate of a little more than, than one a month. Um, and that's solely reactive. So we as a partnership have not yet sort of properly gone proactive um, in terms of leveraging, leveraging new countries to join the partnership. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, just to speak to the opportunity we see next year, there are two or three moments coming up next year in, in the intergovernmental calendar um, where ministers will review progress against SDG 16 in July at the high level political forum. Heads of government will review progress against all sustainable development goals um, at the next UN General Assembly in this week, uh, this month, next year. And also next November, on the 20th of November, we have the 30th anniversary of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And so we see those as three particularly important moments, two of them very political moments that we can use specifically to leverage new governmental commitments um, to step up and do more and do more comprehensively in violence against children. Next slide, please. This slide just overlays um, onto the pathfinding countries, the work, the work that others are doing, whether it's the, the VAC surveys, countries where corporal punishment has been banned, uh, the We Protect uh, work, the It Takes a World campaign, and some of the grantees we have from the End Violence Fund. And it gives a snapshot, and it's a little bit, I, I accept, it's not systematic, it's just not showing where there's systematic change going on, but it just shows that near, in, in nearly every country in the world, bar one or two, um, there is something happening, which gives us, again, a cause for hope, a cause for optimism. But it, of course, what we know is needed is a comprehensive approach to ending violence against children. So it's great that something is happening and we need to find those entry points where something has begun to help those local advocates, policymakers, partners build on um, what is already happening to grow to that comprehensive approach, which I'll now speak a little bit to. Next slide, please. So this is the essence of, of, of pathfinding. We have much more documentation about this, which we can share. I'm not going to speak to every piece on, 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 on this slide, all six things. Um, but it's a question we're often asked, um, and governments who come, as I say, approaching us, um, often have sort of bought into why they want to become a pathfinding country already. I'm just going to speak to the three on the left-hand side here, where I think it's uh, are particularly powerful um, from talking to existing pathfinding countries of why governments join, why countries sign up to be a pathfinding country. Um, and it varies country by country. And I should stress that, of course, within the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, they are universal. So as you'll have seen from that map, our pathfinders range from the UAE to Tanzania to Sweden and beyond. It's a very diverse mix of countries. And so as they join, um, this menu, if you like, of what, what people, why become a pathfinding country, what people want to select and benefit from varies country by country. But the three on the left are particularly powerful. One is the access to resources and technical expertise. The second is, and this is what we're doing today, which is learning from others and showcasing best practice within the, the, within the community uh, working to end violence against children. And the third is being, being part of something bigger. 
um, and being able to link across sectors, across constituencies and across geographical locations. Those three in particular um, seem to be quite resonant with the, with the current pathfinding countries. Um, I won't speak to the three on the other side in the interest of time. Next slide, please. So this may not be completely legible to you, um, and we can share it afterwards. But um, it's what it what happens, and what it what does pathfinding look like, um, and what does action at the country level look like. And I should just say that while we, as the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, promote pathfinding, um, what we want to see is all countries taking a comprehensive, sustained. Uh, and rigorous evidence-based approach to ending violence against children, whether they are a pathfinder or not. It's great if they are, but we don't exist just to grow the number of pathfinding countries in the partnership. We exist to make sure that every country is taking that sustained, uh, resourced, comprehensive action. So this slide, again, I won't speak to all, all of the uh, data on this slide, but what it what it calls out um, in uh, across is that what we know is really powerful is a public political commitment um, to end violence against children, above and beyond the commitment that heads of government have already made explicitly or implicitly through signing up to the Sustainable Development Goals three years ago, we know that the power of an explicit ministerial, preferably head of government level commitment to end violence against children is incredibly powerful in empowering people uh, within and beyond government to hold, but then hold the government to account for turning that commitment into genuine action. Secondly, identification of a focal point within government, the establishment of a multi-sectoral group, both within government and government agencies, but also beyond government, uh, with CSOs, faith groups, and others who are involved in the delivery um, of, of services to end violence against children. The third is the importance of data. I mentioned on a previous slide, the VAC surveys, um, the Violence Against Children surveys is one example of, the, of that, but the, the, the criticality of data to inform evidence-based solutions and inform the preparation of a, of a costed, comprehensive national action plan, um, multi-sectoral, which then becomes implemented, and then critically, again, the uh, monitoring and evaluation of that national action plan. Next slide, please. So just to finish, um, a, few, a few headline thoughts around, within that broader context of um, uh, momentum and opportunity and what we are doing as a global partnership and I've just summarized some of the things that we have to offer uh, in terms of the support etc that we can provide. Um, thinking specifically about the social service workforce um, in the national action plans and we do think that comprehensive national, national action plans um, where children are, are child-centered are really important in those plans looking to promote the policy and the legis legislation around the, the social service workforce um, and so we're doing that and we're encouraging people to do that through building alliances in government um, and through the national and international donor mechanisms which help address that. Secondly, within those national action plans, which always differ by country and must always be context specific, and I know we'll hear some great examples later on today's call, but to make sure that we're clear on the, the types, the functions, the ratios of social workers um, to children, but also the ratios paid and unpaid of those doing in, in the social service workforce and being clear up front um, and planning for that. Thirdly, encouraging multi-sectoral collaboration, um, for example, with, with, with the education sector, with the justice sector, but not just those, with health and other sectors too. Fourthly, the curriculum and standard setting and support for curriculum and standard setting um, with the training of, of the social service workforce. Fifth, the creation of posts in, within, the, within the national civil service um, and looking at the social worker posts at different levels of the system and particularly within the child protection system. So we see that referral networks that need to happen are actually functioning as they should. And finally, the career development and progression um, of, of individuals within a career in, in the social service workforce and what that looks like in terms of, of, of tertiary and higher education um, and links from universities, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. That was fantastic to hear about how the global partnership is, is doing uh, essentially the global support and then reaching down to the regional and national levels to really encourage countries and, and accompany them, accompany them. Um, in their efforts to um, end violence against children. So we will now move and hear from Amy Bess, who's the Director of Global Social Service Workforce Alliance and has been behind helping move this uh, webinar to you today. And she's gonna tell us some, about some of the recent advocacy efforts that have been undertaken by the Alliance. 
Thank you, Catherine. Um, today I'll be presenting about the importance of advocating for the social service workforce and some current efforts that are underway and that are available for everyone to join. Uh, the definition that you see on this slide was developed between about 2010 and 2014 as a result of input from hundreds of people across the globe. It is meant to emphasize the diversity of the workforce and that the workforce is comprised of many cadres of people with various titles, but who all share the common goal to care for, support, promote, and empower vulnerable people, and ultimately help to ensure their healthy development and well-being. I also just wanted to note that this definition has now been more closely reviewed in countries in the Middle East and North Africa and East Asia and the Pacific in particular, as a result of the workforce analyses and mapping exercises that we're supporting there, along with Maestral International and UNICEF. Uh, we'll be consolidating their input, along with other input we've heard from many of you over the years, into a slightly revised definition. And we'll then be seeking broad input on the draft uh, of the new definition from our members in early 2019. So I encourage you to keep your eyes out for your chance to provide feedback on this. The sustainable development goals, particularly those related to health, migration, and child well-being, as, as Howard also mentioned, really cannot be achieved without a strong social service workforce in place. Social service workers are the key implementing actors who ensure that social services reach those who need it most. And therefore, we need a stronger common narrative to advocate for the social service workforce to increase support from decision makers and opinion leaders at the global, regional, and national levels. This will translate into increased investments and improve workforce supportive policies, legislation, and practices. And indeed, this has already um, taken place in, in many countries. So the SDGs just offer one of many current opportunities to galvanize broad support by using common approaches to advocacy and coordinating actions to strengthen the social service workforce, these goals will become more achievable. So over the past few years, the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance has been working on developing these advocacy messages along with our members and with leadership from our group of Alliance ambassadors and our steering committee. We first tested some advocacy messages with different audiences and refined them into an advocacy toolkit. And later in the presentation, I'll provide uh, some images from that and a link to it. But from there, and again with broad input, we developed this call to action that has so far been endorsed by the 34 organizations that you see here on this slide. Uh, the call to action is meant to bring together our partners to jointly call on national and local governments to strengthen the social service workforce and together uh, to improve protection, health and well-being outcomes for children, youth, families and communities as outlined in the SDGs. So within the, the call to action, I just wanted to outline some of the country level actions. We have um, actions at the country level and global level. So at the country level, um, these actions represent those foundational steps that need to be in place in order for the workforce to be able to effectively do its job. So a national level government-led workforce leadership group helps to coordinate national efforts towards strengthening the social service workforce. The group should ideally consist of high-level representatives from government across different ministries, civil society groups and NGOs, universities, professional associations, religious entities, um, donors, multilaterals, bilaterals, private sector, um, and just others who are involved in planning, budgeting, managing, and supporting the country's social service workforce. Just as an example, uh, at our recent symposium in, in May in Washington, DC, we heard about the formation of these groups in Uganda, Scotland, and the Philippines. And second, uh, workforce mapping or analysis is needed to really assess the current status of workforce data and to examine progress against workforce strengthening indicators. The Alliance has 
carried out mapping in 37 countries now. Some are still underway. Um, and more information about this is provided, hopefully you saw it in this past Tuesday's blog um, during our, our current social service workforce week. Uh, so third, a national workforce strengthening strategy that is developed through the National Leadership Group um, and is based on the workforce data from the mapping um, helps to identify gaps that need to be addressed and helps to lay out a clear path forward for different actors to be engaged. These steps will then enable groups to better obtain funding and commitments to uh, implement the strategy and track progress. And then, of course, it's important to commit to um, monitoring, evaluating, and reporting against agreed to indicators. So the workforce strengthening indicators have been discussed for a few years by the Alliance, UNICEF, and PEPFAR in particular, as well as many others. And uh, Kirsten will be providing some more information about this in her presentation later in the webinar. So in terms of global level uh, actions, the call to action recommends that the following actions be taken um, to promote knowledge exchange and building the evidence base. This can be accomplished by participating in learning forums, sharing promising practices across different countries, um, supporting research, raising awareness of existing evidence and building the evidence base through academic and practitioner alliances. Also, um, we need to all work together to increase availability and access to funding. Some of the ideas that have come up are working with donors to establish a pooled fund, uh, expanding public and private partnerships, for instance, um, and then, of course, advocacy. So this next slide is um, in order to support some of these advocacy efforts. As I mentioned earlier, we developed this advocacy toolkit. Uh, this just provides a quick snapshot of some of the images from the toolkit, but it includes infographics, case studies, fact sheets, and worksheets that can be used individually or together. So I do encourage you to take a look at the toolkit and the web page is uh, provided there at the bottom of the slide. We also encourage you to tap into the expertise of our Alliance ambassadors. This is a leadership development program where we bring together experts who can help advocate for the importance of the social service workforce in their countries and regions. We brought on board our first amazing cohort of ambassadors in 2016, and they just completed their two-year term. And then we recently held an orientation for our second cohort of 10 ambassadors who are also from a range of countries and regions. And to learn more about them, there's that link on the top of the slide there. Um, the first cohort saw quite a few successes. And to give just a few quick examples of what um, group advocacy can really accomplish, um, they helped to bring about greater detail and inclusion of the social service workforce in policies and legislation. Uh, in Kenya, the Department of Children's Services um, budget allocation increased by 20%, resulting in employment of 250 children's officers and 120 social protection officers. And a new professional association of social workers in Haiti is getting off the ground, and associations in other countries, such as Uganda, are really becoming very active. So we hope that you will join us and redouble your advocacy efforts for the social service workforce. We do invite you to become a member if you're not already and to receive updates on other ways to be involved. Uh, the website link is provided here. There are a lot of ways to be engaged either through Social Service Workforce Week this week, through other annual events such as World Social Work Day, Social Work Day at the UN, um, local events and conferences and supporting the call to action in the ways that I've outlined. And as we'll hear more about today, there are also many ways of being involved in your country's national plan of action to end violence against children. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you on all these activities. Super, thank you so much, Amy. Very interesting and fantastic to see how important the advocacy is. And when I think of advocacy, I often think that the best proof of advocacy is what's going on on the ground with successful um, interventions and projects and national plans um, around the world. So 
in that sense, we're moving sort of down to deeper and deeper layers. And I'm pleased to introduce um, Nella Kernik from the UNICEF Child Protection Office, uh, Child Protection Section in the Montenegro UNICEF Country Office. And she's going to tell us a little bit about what's happening in Montenegro. Thank you very much, Katrin. Uh, thank you very much to Global uh, Social Service Workforce Alliance and the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and, and of course, UNICEF uh, for actually inviting us and recognizing Montenegro's experience as valuable uh, model of good practice to be presented at this webinar. Uh, I, I have a pleasure actually uh, to participate in this webinar and to present uh, maybe into more details and, and to provide some more in-depth uh, picture about what's happening actually in Montenegro in this regard. Uh, so maybe at the uh, first, um, uh, it's, uh, it's important actually to note that uh, when it comes to the data and the evidences on the extent of violence against children in Montenegro, uh, we cannot say that we, ha that we have uh, reliable data about the prevalence of the problem and we actually in a way cannot rely on, on administrative data that, uh, that, that exists in the country from different sources. However, According to the multiple cluster indicator survey from 2013, uh, in Montenegro, 69% uh, of children aged 1 to 14 years were subjected to at least one form of psychological or physical punishment by their parents or adult household members during the, uh, the past month preceding the survey. Uh, so this is uh, one uh, of the indication uh, how do we stand when it comes uh, to factual situation in Montenegro. Montenegro, and it's worth uh, to note that we are just to launch, we actually yesterday have launched officially uh, beginning of the new mix uh, to, for 2018, and we actually expect to uh, be uh, given and provided with some more reliable data about the prevalence of the problem. Uh, this is one of the reasons uh, why our country actually attaches uh, great attention to the issue of protection of children from violence, abuse, neglect, and any form of exploitation. And it's very visible in the fact that Montenegro became pathfinding country to the Global pa Partnership to End Violence Against Children in 2017. Uh, the, in the year uh, prior to that, uh, the government of Montenegro actually established high-level interministerial body, intersectoral body, uh, which meets on a regular basis and, and discuss uh, pressing issues when it comes to violence against children in the country. And this body is chaired uh, by the deputy prime minister. So this is one of the, of the additional signs and indications how much uh, actually uh, Montenegro as a country attached uh, to this issue. Uh, and uh, Montenegro uh, had the opportunity uh, this year, at the beginning of the year, to uh, showcase uh, some uh, good example of practice uh, from community level at the global <clears throat> summit which was organized uh, in Stockholm. And during the presentation, I will have actually the opportunity to tell you uh, more about this experience. Next slide, please. So as you can see, uh, this is one more evidence about the importance uh, the country of Montenegro attached actually to the protection of children from violence and any form of exploitation. Uh, actually, protection of children from violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation is guaranteed by the constitution of Montenegro. And apart from that, uh, it is regulated through many different pieces of leg legislation, either in criminal, civil or other areas. I would just like to emphasize the recent amendments to the family law of Montenegro from 2017, which actually prohibited all forms of corporal punishment in all settings. And that is the novelty which is uh, really worth to be mentioned uh, at this place. Next slide, please. In accordance uh, with the requirements of the global partnership, but also in accordance with the high-level agenda, political agenda of our government in Montenegro, uh, the first ever strategy, national strategy for prevention and protection of children from violence has been adopted for the period from 2017 to 2021. The, the strategy was developed by the intersectoral uh, working group composing uh, of representatives of different ministries, ombudspersons office, civil 
civil society organizations, and it was technically uh, its development was technically supported by UNICEF. Uh, the strategy contains action plan with a set of uh, indicators so that the progress can be properly monitored. And you can see on the left side the major objectives of the uh, strategy, which are mainly related to further harmonization of policy and legal framework with re relevant international human rights standards and instruments, to building of the capacities of the system and um, the infrastructure for effective protection of children from violence. Important part in this uh, objective, of course, is the capacity building of social service workforce. But, however, not only that, uh, it also focuses a lot on development of some supporting services like expansion of home visitation service, development of parenting programs, outreach services, data in a way uh, supporting social service uh, workforce in their uh, uh, important uh, work uh, related to protection of children from violence. Uh, all uh, aspects uh, of protection of children from violence are covered by the strategy, meaning uh, it also refers to the judicial system, education system reform, health sector reform, and not, not, not only uh, to social sector reform. Of course, the change of social norms is uh, one of the ingredients which, are, which is extremely important uh, for the overall process, and it is uh, part of the strategy. We can go further. When it comes overall uh, to the reform of the social and child protection sector in Montenegro, which has uh, been uh, underway for more than a decade in Montenegro, uh, these are the strategic directions of the reform, uh, which are important to be mentioned. So at first, the, 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 the overall objective is to have the social and child protection system harmonized with international standards, uh, then cultivation of multi-sectoral approach and prevention of social problems, even when it comes to protection of children from violence, decentralization and deinstitutionalization as major directions of development of the system of social and child protection, uh, ensuring equal access and quality of services and predominantly family support and family and community-based services, and of course ensuring participation of children and uh, other beneficiaries uh, in, uh, individual, in, in uh, development of individual plans of protection. We can go further. Uh, as a result of the comprehensive reform process that was run by the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare of Montenegro with the support uh, of UN agencies in the country, meaning UNDP and UNICEF, and with financial support of the delegation of European Union in Montenegro, actually uh, we succeeded in a way uh, to build many missing blocks uh, in the social and child protection system. And as you can see, this what is circled in red are the new bodies within the social and child protection system that were not existent before. Each of them is very important for development of social service workforce. And I would just emphasize at this point uh, the new Institute for Social and Child Protection, which was established in 2015, and uh, which is uh, like the leading agency for development of the social service workforce in the country and ensuring quality assurance of the system. And also uh, the uh, huge amount of work which is uh, directed directed to uh, building of the capacities of centers for social work, uh, which are seen as a key service, social, ser social service actually in the country, uh, in a way frontline, ser frontline service uh, for working with vulnerable children and families. Uh, so uh, these uh, centers uh, have been reorganized and expanded uh, through the country, and we will see on the, on the next slide actually how uh, the process uh, was organized. Uh, what we did, uh, the Ministry actually of Labor and Social Welfare with technical assistance of UNICEF in 2011 conducted uh, the in-depth analysis of the work of Centers for Social Work, uh, who, provides, uh, di who provide direct support, support to children and families uh, in the need, vulnerable children and families. And we found out uh, through, the uh, through the assessment uh, that there was serious issue of understaffing, a low, much lower level of professional staff uh, than it was expected uh, for efficient work uh, with the population, um, higher number of administrative staff, uh, some anachron and uh, uh, 
uh, working methodologies uh, which were very uh, which posed some limitations in terms of effective work with uh, beneficiaries and all of this in a way uh, influenced important gaps in service provision uh, to vulnerable children and families uh, the process uh, was uh, uh, actually this resulted, uh, the, the analysis resulted in a compact and synchronized intervention of all partners, uh, which uh, has been uh, lasting even uh, today. And it resulted in development of the new legal framework, a set of bylaws and regulatory framework for reorganization of the work of centers for social work. Uh, there uh, was increase in the number of professional uh, staff in centers for social work for 60% compared to 2000 and 11. Uh, the government also introduced case management methodology as an official methodology in working uh, with uh, vulnerable, vulnerable children and families, including victims of violence. And more than 100 social workers has been, have been licensed uh, through the Institute for Social and Child Protection. In the same uh, time, uh, the social welfare information system has been rolled out uh, to uh, somehow accompany the changes that happen in terms of conceptual framework and the introduction of the case management. And this IT system is supposed not only to administer financial allowances uh, to vulnerable population, but also to follow the whole case management process uh, that is implemented within the centers for social work. Uh, territorial re reorganization of the centers also happened and uh, as mentioned before this establishment of the institute was a key uh, because it introduced uh, for the first time licensing of social service workforce uh, uh, as an uh, obligation and mandatory uh, prerequisite for work in the social and child protection system and accreditation of programs uh, for your information uh, the new analysis uh, is currently underway uh, because there is an intention uh, on the, of the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare actually to take the stock of the reform and uh, to uh, analyze the progress and actually um, somehow determine uh, the further directions and roadmap uh, for the period in front of us in order to continue with the development of the uh, social service workforce in the country. Next slide, please. Now I am going uh, to take a few minutes of your time uh, to uh, tell a few sentences about uh, the uh, case study, example of good practice that was uh, uh, presented in, at the Global uh, Summit in Stockholm. Uh, it is about community-based operational multidisciplinary teams for protection of children from violence, abuse and neglect. Uh, these teams uh, were established in 2002 uh, by the Ministry of Labor and Social Welfare with support, uh, technical and financial support of UNICEF and UNHCR. Today in Montenegro we have 17 uh, teams in 17 municipalities uh, and these teams are actually uh, supposed to provide multi-sectoral holistic intervention in the cases of in the severe cases of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, they are since today covered more than 2,500 children with protective measures and we can go to the further slide. So I can show you, actually, did we, did we have a social service workforce, actually Center for Social Work, as a key agency which coordinates the work uh, of, the, uh, of all other sectors in, in the aspect of protection of children from violence at community level. Social service, social service uh, is actually in charge uh, for invitation of all other sectors, calling intersectoral meetings, developing intersectoral and holistic individual plans of protection and actually ensuring proper in implementation of the plans and monitoring of the plans when it comes to protection of children from violence. As you can see, in each team we have representative of education sector, health sector, police, judiciary uh, and uh, NGO participants apart from the uh, social service uh, workforce. We can go further. 
uh, this is the comparison of what uh, uh, what actually uh, what are the lessons learned and how we can measure the progress comparing uh, to the situation before the establishment of the teams uh, in general we can say that before establishment of the teams the reaction of the system uh, especially in the cases of the severe violence against children was sporadic fragmented uh, was not um, efficient in terms of the timing uh, resources allocated etc Etc. And after establishment of the teams, it's very important that the uh, children are now uh, provided with more efficient, immediate, uh, holistic uh, system response and support. And uh, actually, uh, there is a 24-hour service also established uh, in order uh, to, to, to uh, avoid uh, the limitations uh, that were that existed, existed in the system before. Um, in the same time, uh, uh, because we wanted to ensure the uniform practice of work of all teams uh, through the country, the guidelines, actually standards of work uh, of, of the teams uh, have been developed and adopted uh, by uh, the relevant ministry so that all teams uh, can ensure uniform standards of practice in their work. And these guidelines, for example, consist the matrices for recognition of violence, for assessment of violence, a detection, early intervention, etc. Uh, the fact that we have uh, the teams now who operate in these uh, the most severe cases of violence against children uh, also contributed uh, to the lower level of burnout among professionals because somehow now they can share responsibility for very important decisions that affect the lives of children and families. Uh, and uh, in the same way, uh, and in the same time, also uh, we can say that the that evidences and documentation about the cases uh, uh, also uh, has been improved uh, through the time. So this would be from our side for the time being. Uh, we try to be as short as possible, and of course we are open for all questions. And thank you very very much for listening. Thank you, Nella. That was um, a fascinating um, deep dive into Montenegro to see how you really developed over the um, last decade, slowly and steadily, to really provide excellent services for children. So with uh, the Montenegro country case study behind us, let's now move um, to Tanzania. And I'm delighted to introduce Sebastian Siku from the Head of Social Services and Delivery, um, Policy Forum and Officials from the President's Office. Um, Sebastian, welcome. Oh, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I would like to make a little a little correction on the, my my title and the and the, uh, uh, the office that I'm coming from. I'm from the the Minister of Health, Community Development, Gender, Adult and Children. I've been working with the President Office, but have recently shifted to to this new office. So I'm currently a, 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 a child rights development. Um, uh, 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 assistant director. So that's. Uh, I hope you are going to correct it. And uh, I will. I will present on strengthening social services workforce in Tanzania. But if, before I start my presentation, uh, I would like to quote a, a few words which have been really. Uh, we have been working on these few words from the former former UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon, who said, "Violence against the children." is never excusable, is never acceptable, and is never tolerable. And we are really working on, on, on this dream to make it a, it a reality in Tanzania. Now, uh, coming to where we come from uh, as a country, we, we came a long way back in addressing violence against the children back in the year 2009, when actually we commissioned the, the first study on violence against the children. And in 2011, we we uh, uh, we, re we released the first the first report on violence against the children in Tanzania. It is when also we were named as a, one of the past finding country uh, in Tanzania. Now, uh, from that study, we we uh, uh, we came to realize that there are three major major violence against the uh, children in Tanzania. The first one is physical violence. The second one is emotional violence, and the third one is sexual sexual violence. Now, what, after we realized this, then as a country, we, we said we need to do something. We, we came up with an action plan, a national uh, plan of action, which was more of, of mass sector that involved the different sectors, 
uh, in terms of the you know government agencies, government uh, departments, involving also other other sectors, including civil society organisations, private sector, and so on. And then within that within that framework, we had also a child protection system, uh, 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 of which we we really implemented for that for the, for the for the for three years. And then in 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 2016, we did an evaluation to see to what extent we've really addressed the violence against the children uh, uh, um, in, in those areas that were identified uh, from that study. And then we, 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 we came to realize that there were still so many fragmented plans to address violence against the children. Please move to the next slide. Yeah, we, we came to realize that uh, the, the, there are a number of fragmented actions to you know, to address violence against the children. We are about eight of them, and then we said we need really to you know to 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 bring this together so that we have one comprehensive national plan of action. And then this was under our leadership as a ministry, Minister of Community uh, Development, Minister of Health, Community Development, Gender, Elder, and Children, and also the Prime Minister's. Uh, as one of the you know leading ministry and then we hired a consultant then we came together as a team from different sectors from different civil society involving civil society organization faith-based organization and so on and then we had a series of you know uh, uh, consultation sessions that we really we really pulled a lot of information for different stakeholders and then we, we were we used inspire inspire strategies to you know to that developed the global uh, strategy to end violence against the women and the children. And then by the end of the day, we came to, to form eight thematic areas of our new national, national uh, plan of action to end violence against the women and the children. Next slide, please. From these from this, um, uh, uh, thematic areas, as you can see, there are eight. There are eight. One is on household economic strengthening. We focus on strengthening the economic uh, empowerment of the of the you know household to make sure that they're economically strong. The norms and the values. We, we are also focusing on safe environment and, and the public spaces. Make sure that the environment for women and children are, are safe in, in 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 public spaces. We focus on the parenting family support and relationship. We focused this, this plan also focusing on the implementation and enforcement of laws. It also focusing on the response and the support services, particularly of the victim and survivors of the violence. Focus also on the safe schools and life skills, safe schools environment and life skills in schools. But the last, the last the thematic area is on the coordination, monitoring, and the evaluation. Now coming to the social social service workforce. Next slide, please. Well, we, we, we did an assessment on human resources to see to what extent really, you know, what are the gaps when it comes to you know, social services workforce in, in Tanzania. We, 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 did, we did an assessment across different levels, down from the world level, district level, and the regional level. This is the lower, lower local government levels where the, you know, the act implementation are done. So we did an assessment uh, and uh, we wanted also to know from that assessment, we wanted to know the number, the number, and uh, the number of the community development workers, the social welfare officers, the educational officers, the justice, who are the really implementers uh, uh, of the uh, you know uh, uh, child protection issues at that level. And then we identified uh, from that assessment, we, we realized that. We, we have a, a gap. We have a gap in terms of the of the uh, of the of the cadre that we really need to make sure that we implement, we address the challenges uh, uh, with regards to women and children in terms of the violence. And then we started a certain intervention with the limited resources, with the limited human resources that we have. We introduced guidance and counseling teachers in school in order to address all the forms of violence violence in schools. So we, in all primary and secondary schools across the country, there are the teachers who attend as guidance and counseling teachers. But again, we 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 uh, um, are at different levels from ward, district to regional, 
and uh, and uh, and um, regional uh, at the regional level we 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 create we uh, we make made sure that we have our local development workers at that level whereby we we enforced our our focal development colleges which are from different levels down to the to the district level to make sure that they are producing cadres who will fill the gaps that we we realized now comes to, to capacity building of our uh, social way, social service workforce we, we 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 developed the national standard training manuals for these cadres, the existing cadres, the social fair uh, workers, the police, the justice actors, teachers, community development and health professionals. To make sure that at least we have, they have we have a standardized manual that will be used across the country. And uh, and uh, from this from this manual, we trained the social service workforce. For instance. We, we trained the social welfare officers. We are about 592. We are trained at the district level and uh, uh, on protection of women and children. But again, don't have a current statistics because this is an ongoing process where the number kept on increasing every day. But again, we also trained uh, community development officers to make sure that they are capable and they are in the position to support women and children at their level. And uh, we also managed to mainstream violence against ch children uh, a curriculum for social work programs. We have social work programs, and uh, and uh, you know from community development, teachers, and the labor labor officers. Uh, currently, child protection mainstreaming completed to, uh, to nine out of twelve social work institutions across the country. So we have twelve uh, social work institutions ac across the country, but the process of mainstreaming has been completed for for nine for nine institutions. So we're still uh, going on to make sure that we, we, we mainstream on, in all 12 social work institutions. But we're, again, we also have guardians and counseling teachers to all schools in the country. So these are also uh, areas which we really feel that we, we manage to mainstream in different areas. In terms of supporting workforce, we, we, we initiated uh, our regional mentors. At the regional level is where now the operation is normally start, is starting and is a place where the you know regions can oversee the intervention at the district ward and the lower local government levels. So what we did, we said because of the limited number of uh, you know uh, uh, social workforce in, in lower local government levels, we said we need to you know to mentor to create you know mentors at the regional level. Uh, and these uh, 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 mentors were trained by uh, uh, social workers from the headquarters, from the, the, the from the minister at the ministerial level, and then they were the one who would train the regional social welfare officers and the district social welfare officers uh, to make sure that they have capacity to make sure that they you know they address issues relating to violence against women and children. But but again, we, may, we make sure that the social work that we have down to the lower local government level are equipped with the with the different facilities we supplied computers again we renovated some of the buildings to in order to improve the conducive working environment we also provided uh, transport with the you know for for case follow up uh, at, in those levels so these are the improvements that 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 we did in order to make sure that at least we these services are taking place on the ground now, in order to fill in the gaps that we have, the existing gaps of social service workforce, aside of the social work, uh, social welfare officers, the community development workers, the police, and all these at those levels, as I mentioned to you, that we have a gap so far. So we introduced cadre of volunteers, the community case workers, at the village level. You know, most of these cadres that I mentioned to you before. They are uh, at, at least at the level of the ward, but down to the lower local government level, at the village level, we really uh, faced a lot of challenges. Now we, we introduce these cadres, the community case workers, and uh, most of these are volunteers, and also case supervisors who are based at the ward level. Uh, uh, this, this, all these are part of the national integrated case management system. Um, uh, all, all the, we have done all this in order to address the shortage of you know social workers across the country. Uh, again, we trained 466 districts master trainers 
who later on, who they after trained 15,000 plus uh, social case workers at village levels in 68 local government authorities out of 185 local government authorities that we have in the country. Uh, again, we have, uh, uh, we, you know, Tanzania is also surrounded by some of the countries which have, you know, experienced a lot of violence, including Burundi and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we are hosting uh, a number of refugees. So the refugees are in the, in the camps. So we as a government, we said we need also to support our children in the refugee camps. So we deployed the government social welfare officers from other local government authorities that are surrounding those camps to support case management in three local government authorities and refugee camps. But again, we had a, a, a challenge of the earthquake in the in the country. We also deployed some local government authority, I mean, social welfare officers in those in those camps. So uh, uh, this is the other part of the of the of the of the area that which we, we really we really deployed our, our social welfare officers. And of course, these social welfare officers are still also assisted by the community case workers, the you know, uh, and, uh, and the cases uh, supervisors at at different levels down at the lower local government level. Again, we also added the social welfare officers who were recruited specifically to cover the gaps in the refugee camps. So. This is the effort which we, we, we normally, which we have been doing in our country, make sure that we address the challenges, the challenges of social uh, social services uh, workforce in the in the country. So um, this is it. So thank you so much for your your attention. Thank you, Sebastian. It was great hearing from Tanzania, another country who's been working on this for nearly a decade now, like building up the system. Um, it's a fantastic case study for our, our listeners. We are now going to turn to Kristen DiMartino, who is the Senior Advisor of Child Protection at UNICEF. And Kristen's going to address some of the strategies to strengthen the social service workforce uh, that are specific to child protection. Welcome, Kirsten. Uh, thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you also to the Global Social Services Workforce Alliance, and especially Amy Nicole for helping to organize this webinar, and also to colleagues from the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children and all the other speakers from the country offices. Um, I'm very conscious of time, so I will jump straight into my presentation. Um, what I would like to say, first of all, and I think it became clear from all the previous presentations, is that I think we all agree that we cannot uh, effectively address all forms of violence against children without an effective child protection system in place. And critical, a critical component, a critical element of, of such a system is a strong social services workforce with a clear mandate to protect uh, all children. Uh, we all know that no system can be function in a coherent, comprehensive and holistic manner without the very individuals that make that system effectively come to life and that drive the system and make it function in, uh, in practice. So this is why a well-planned, a trained, a supported social service workflow workforce plays such a critical role in identifying, preventing and managing risks and responding to situations of vulnerability, but also situations when harm has already occurred. Unfortunately, from our experience worldwide and based on UNICEF's uh, evaluation of our violence against children programs, what we have discovered is actually that social services workforce strengthening remains one of the weakest components of any national child protection system. So we really have to step up our efforts in this regard. Uh, fortunately, we now have the uh, um uh, SDGs, which clearly put uh, violence against children high on the agenda. And as a result, more and more states and more and more countries are turning their attention to social services workforce strengthening and actually reaching out to uh, UNICEF and other partners for assistance in this. So as a result of this now, um, we are significantly enhancing our support to social services workforce strengthening 
And we have, of course, made this a priority intervention for all our child protection uh, programs, including uh, ensuring that this is uh, uh, addressed in key tools and resources, such as the Inspire package, which clearly addresses the need for response and support services uh, for all to prevent and respond to all forms of violence against children. Next. So, as I said before, one of the key uh, lessons learned from our previous UNICEF strategic plan is that if a state is to have uh, any impact on reducing physical, sexual and emotional violence against children, that it really needs to invest and build much more social service uh, systems and capacities to uh, address these issues. As a result of this, uh, the new UNICEF strategic plan for the years 2018 to uh, 2021 uh, now places a high priority on ensuring that every girl and boy is protected from violence and exploitation. So ending violence against children is now an organiza organization-wide and multi-sectoral priority for UNICEF as an organization. And workforce strengthening is also a key pillar of achieving goal three of the UNICEF strategic plan and is now a high priority intervention together also with uh, parenting support. Um, please move on, thank you. Uh, what we have done to support um, social services work for strengthening at country level is we have developed a strategic framework for strengthening the social services workforce for child protection as a whole, not only violence against children. Um, this framework is very much uh, adapted from the framework developed uh, by the Global uh, Social Services Workforce Alliance. And if you look at this strategic framework from the bottom, you will see that uh, the first step that we need to take is to create really an enabling environment. We have to advocate at the highest levels for governments and, and countries to give priority priority and attention and the attention it deserves to social services workforce strengthening. Um, secondly, we need to help and guide countries on how to actually do this. So we have to support countries to plan the social services workforce, to develop it and to support it. Critical things that need to happen in this process is, for example, in establishing a clear normative framework for social services workforce strengthening, training and capacity building of the social services workforce, ensuring there is quality supervision and systems in place, that there is accreditation and licensing mechanisms in place, and of course that there's appropriate information management systems to create evidence-based decision-making uh, around uh, the much-needed uh, workforce and how to expand this workforce. Um, if you look further up at the strategic framework, you will see that social service workforce plays uh, very diverse roles. It has a role to play in promotive work. That means in helping to strengthen the legal and policy frameworks and in developing budgets. Uh, the social services workforce can also participate in national assessments and analysis of where the workforce is at. It has a very key role to play in engaging on uh, social norms, especially social norms that are harmful to children, and of course in setting up accountability and ethical frameworks. The workforce also has a very important role to, to play in preventive work. So, for example, supporting at-risk children and families through parenting programs, psychosocial support, social protection support, including cash and grant grants, etc. It has to a very important role to play in gatekeeping, pre preventing unnecessary family separation, etc. Then, of course, uh, what we usually uh, traditionally think of as a key role for the social services workforce is the direct services. So providing direct support and services to children to prevent and respond to violence against children, but also ensuring a referral to other services and the connection with, with the justice system and, and quality care. 
They play a critical role in case management and ensuring the full participation of children, including that their views are heard and taken into consideration. And of course, in the best interest determination uh, of what action should be taken under any particular circumstances uh, for children. And finally, they can play a rehabilitative uh, role by providing services such as long-term therapeutic services, linking to medical and psychosocial interventions, or rehabilitative and reintegration services. So this is broadly the strategic framework uh, that we have developed, and we can go on to the next slide. Um, what is important, uh, what I wanted to also say prior to, to moving on to this slide, sorry, is that we are developing um, different resources to support countries to implement this strategic framework. So we are currently finalizing a program guidance on ending violence against children and adolescents. Uh, we are also developing guidelines to strengthen the social services workforce for child, child for child protection this is supposed to be a very simple practical and user friendly tool that uh, can be used by all actors at the country level who are engaging in social services uh, workforce strengthening so in addition to that, we are also helping countries to establish baselines uh, on social services workforce strengthening so that they can understand where they are at and uh, track progress as they develop this uh, area of work. We have developed for this for our country offices under our current strategic plan three key indicators that are basically mandatory for all country offices. The first indicator relates to the availability of a quality assurance system for social service work. The second indicator relates to the number of social service workers with responsibility for child protection per 100,000 children. And the third indicator relates to the number and percentage of social service workers who have been certified to work with child victims through UNICEF supported programs. Now, the, for the first indicator in particular, we have um, developed sort of three um, criteria to rate the progress that is being uh, made. The first one is, is there a normative framework in place outlining or defining the functions, roles and responsibilities of the social services workforce. The second criteria, is there a system of supervision and support? The third criteria relates to, license, relates to licensing and accreditation of the social work professionals. And the fourth criteria relates to the normative definition of data collection systems. And we can move on to the next slide. Uh, what we have done as UNICEF is based on these criteria for the availability of quality assurance systems for social services workforce, we um, basically um, conducted a baseline survey in uh, 2017 in 146 UNICEF uh, program countries. And what we found was the following. We basically found that uh, 45, uh, 45 um, countries indicated a strong normative framework for social services work. That's about 31%. That 31 countries have finalized the system of supervision and support. Uh, that's about 21% of all countries. And that 30 countries had a strong accreditation and professional management system in place, about 20% of all countries. And that 26 countries have solid data management systems in place to on, on social services workforce strength, which is about 18%. So we have this baseline now, and we hope that with this baseline, we can track progress. Uh, the idea is that, uh, for example, for the normative framework, we will have hopefully about 97 countries who will have achieved a strong normative framework by 2021, that we will hopefully have 73 countries who have uh, a system, a strong system of supervision and support in place by 2021. And we're also aiming for about 57 countries with a strong accreditation and professional management system by 2021, as well as about 60 countries to have a solid management system in place. And countries self-assess themselves in, in, in this baseline survey and, of course, have set their own um, targets. 
So I will stop there, conscious of time, and I would like again to thank you all very much. And we, of course, as UNICEF, we look forward to continuing to work with all partners at the global, regional, and country level. And finally, I wish you all a very happy social services workforce uh, strengthening week. Thank you. Thank you all for those wonderful presentations. And we're now going to move to the question and answer session. And um, Caddy will begin posing the first questions. And we ask you to note them in the question box. And we will pose the questions as we receive them. Okay, and our first question has come in. It's um, directed to Sebastian. Sebastian, we will ask you to respond. In Tanzania, when you reference the social welfare officer, um, the question is if the officer has social work training or other certifications and backgrounds, and what's the requirement for this position? Hello. Sebastian? Yes, hi Sebastian, if you could answer the question about, um, this is Kati again, sorry, I was muted for a moment. Um, if you could talk about um, what is the accreditation for social welfare officers? Like what kind of background does a social welfare officer need in Tanzania um, to become an officer? And, you know, so what are the requirements for that post? Well, a social welfare officer has to go through the uh, secondary schools. At certificate level, has to finish grade four from four uh, uh, secondary level education, and then will be trained for two years, and then will be awarded a certificate. But Excellent. for the for the yes for the for the for the diploma, a form six C holder can go for a diploma course that will also take two years, and then will be awarded a certificate for the diploma diploma course, and then for the degree holder has to either uh, uh, having a certificate on diploma is a requirement or uh, can go from uh, 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 form six level and then can go direct for a, a degree of uh, a social worker and then we have also a, a cadre for the master's degree of course after the first degree and then you can go for the master degree if if you qualify for that for that position excellent so it sounds like there's quite a bit of um levels that um uh Tanzanian can enter in order to serve as a social welfare officer. And could you briefly please tell us, uh, do you have community social workers in Tanzania? Yes, we do have. We do have community social workers in Tanzania at different levels. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't have more, much from, from the lower local government level at the village level, but starting from the ward level, district level, regional level, they are there. Though they are not, they are not enough in number to meet the requirements that we have, but they are there. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, there was also a question um, from one of the listeners about the global partnership, and um, there's actually two questions about the global partnership. I'll handle the first one, and then if um, Howard is still with us, I'll let him. Um, actually speak to the second one. Um, the first question was about the global partnership and working in conflict countries and humanitarian settings, uh, particularly from South Sudan, uh, the question came, asking if we do and what, what we're doing. So basically the way the global partnership is um, somewhat divided now, though we do work across a continuum, is that we have three pillars um, within the fund um, of the global, per the global um, partnership. One is for online violence, one is for everyday violence, and one is for humanitarian and conflict settings. So indeed we do. It is um, currently the only, the two countries we're working in are Japan, uh, pardon me, are Uganda and Nigeria. Um, and that was thanks to some generous funding from Japan. But we are indeed looking to expand into the humanitarian setting. This is extremely important to us. Um, that we continue um, working across all of the different areas, online, everyday, and humanitarian, and addressing the needs of people there. 
I also want to add that the Alliance has a For Children project in South Sudan um, that has three different components, which are all proving to have some really positive outcomes. Um, the parent training curriculum, um, which is showing some very, very good outcomes and a de decrease in violence. Um, the Alliance is also working with para social workers um, to ident identify cases of violence, and they work specifically on tracing and reunification, and that's been quite successful. They're measuring the effects of that. And then finally, the Alliance is working in South Sudan on teachers' um, awareness of violence um, through multiple sessions with a special focus on sexual exploitation in schools. So the, I would suggest that um, the Alliance link up with the South Sudanese um, uh, audience, if, if, if not already linked up. But yeah, there are great things going on, and we do indeed, from the partnership, want to expand into more um, humanitarian settings. Um, there was also another question. Um, Howard had to leave, unfortunately, for another meeting um, about the global partnership and our work um, with CIVAC in um, South Asia. This, um, sorry, but yeah, with CIVAC. So yes, we're working in South Asia. You know. The partnership is new. We're, we're relatively young. It's only two years old, and we have about 24 pathfinding countries right now, and we have lots more that are in the process of considering to become a pathfinding country. So yes, we do, to answer this question specifically, want to be working um, in, in more uh, South Asian countries, and also working with CIVAC as a regional body um, to, to help promote the work of um, the good work that's going on in the region. So I'm not sure, I, I, there was a specific reference to the uh, Nepal and the weak um, system there, um, some types of violence such as gang rapes and killings of girls, um, et cetera. Those are all issues that are very, very important to the partnership. Um, we want to help countries and we suggest that countries such as Nepal that are interested in joining the partnership um, contact us and we will sort of give you the steps to doing that. The most important important being getting some type of public commitment from your government with a focal point in place. So um, let's see now what other kinds of questions we have coming in. Um, there's a question here for Kirsten, so I will pass that over to Kirsten. Um, in 2017 baseline findings, are the countries with the system of licensing, the 30 countries that you talked about, also the same countries which have a system of supervision and support? Um, not necessarily. We have those details. We would have to to compare it. So each country may have one thing, may have a normative uh, framework in place, but may not have accreditation system in place, or may not have the supervision system in place. We have that information available, so we can also um, share that with specific countries. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, this goes back to Tanzania, to Sebastian. You mentioned volunteers at the community level as part of the integrated case management system. Um, there's a question from the audience about how that works and if you have a plan to ensure that it can be a sustainable um, type system in, in, in effect or sustainable for the social, social workers. Um, this is from Miriam in Nigeria. Well, in, in terms of how they work, they work uh, closely with the local government authorities at that level, at the village level. But, but again, we are looking for the possibility, because we trained them, because these uh, uh, community case workers, in most cases, are really trained to the level of certificate holders. In most cases, because we don't have enough certificate holders, then we replace them with the community case workers. What we are doing in order to make sure that these posts are sustainable, we are requesting the government, the central government, to make sure that they are also deployed. They are also part of the government employees uh, uh, who are permanent and pensionable. So we are yet, we are yet to be mainstreamed in the government system, but we are, we are requesting the, you know, the employment uh, uh, bureau to make sure that they are also uh, mainstreamed. But again, uh, uh, well, well, if if this is not going to happen. Currently, our our institutions are producing more uh, certificate holders who will fill in the gaps of the community case workers because there are some regulations which you need to you know to follow in order for the case community workers to be part of the of the government employment system. Okay, 
Um, thank you, Sebastian. And just a question related to that around Tanzania, and then I will move um, to a question on Montenegro for Nella. Um, the, the, the related question is, is the government of Tanzania working with um, other partners around refugee issues? Um, and if so, can you tell us a little bit about who those partners are? And um, this, So let's start with that one. The work you're doing with refugees. Sebastian? Yes. Yes. Did you hear? Yeah, your question, if, 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 I, if, if I'm not wrong, your question is, is which are the partners that are working in supporting the refugee camps? Exactly. Oh, Who yes. Uh, one, of the, one of the partners, actually, UNICEF, with the leading partner, who is supporting you know, uh, social welfare officers to work in the refugee camps. But also, we have also saved the children. But the Plan International are also supporting the, the you know, the, the social welfare officers in refugee camps. Yeah, just to mention a few. Okay. Um, the same person was asking a question which I think I can answer on your behalf, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Are the social workers in Tanzania certified and licensed? I think you explained it beautifully that there's multiple levels and um, criteria for entering the social work workforce. Um, so, um, I, and, and it depends on, you know, you have certain levels that are moving up all the way up to a master's degree. Um, yeah. So indeed people are licensed. Um, has, has this credentialing, has it improved the delivery of social work in Tanzania? And I know that's a big question, but if you could just give us a brief answer, that'd be fantastic. Yes, you're right, you're right. In order to, uh, to be named as a social welfare officer, you have to have a certificate. It can be the certificate at the lower level, diploma level, the degree level, and the master's degree level. But to be, sure, to be sincere, they have improved a lot, the you know, social service provision in Tanzania. Only the challenge that we have is we have a huge country, but in terms of the number, they're so limited. We are we're currently struggling in order in order you know to fill the gaps. That's why we are using the community case workers, you know, and all this. But currently we 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 feel we really feel that they've you know done a well done job in order to improve the social work services. Super, and I, I think um, you're absolutely right on that. Having worked in Tanzania and seen the program evolve, I think you're doing a fantastic job, and it's making a big difference. We're now going to move to a question um, primarily for Montenegro, and it's a it's a it's a question that is really important because we often need to tackle this issue. It's about um, well, first of all, it's fantastic to see both the Tanzanian and Montenegrin government so supportive of these efforts to strengthen strengthen the social um, service workforce. But in Montenegro, usually national budgets, in many countries, usually national budgets for child protection are, are minimal compared to the rest of um, the budgets um, throughout the different ministries. And we know that that's an issue everywhere. What, what were the main challenges in Montenegro? Did you need to fight to establish a new structure um, with, social, with the social welfare workforce? Um, did it create um, animosity and competition between services? And, and what did you do to advocate for this and get it on the agenda and get it funded? Nella? You there, Nella? Katrin, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Nella. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, it's in a way was a long-lasting story. Um, uh, we, as UNICEF, at one moment in time, um, uh, intervened uh, in supporting the government uh, to solve uh, uh, one uh, situation of human rights uh, violations of children in uh, one uh, child care institution. And uh, it was like a trigger and beginning for the comprehensive reform of the social and child protection system. Uh, uh, and uh, in that time period, uh, we uh, somehow um, succeeded uh, to establish broad partnership uh, with the Council of Europe, uh, with the European Union, delegation of European Union to Montenegro and government of Montenegro. And somehow uh, we, uh, were, say, we were all uh, on board 
and having the same intention and that was the, to engage in the comprehensive reform of the system because the situation in that institution was only the trigger and uh, on the basis of the analysis that we did, uh, we uh, realized somehow that the overall system should be reformed uh, literally from scratch and that's the reason why uh, Montenegro as a country received important financial assistance from European Union and important technical assistance uh, from the UN agencies and engaged in the reform uh, which uh, was worth uh, more than three and a half millions which is for Montenegro uh, a big amount. So um, I would say that uh, partnership was instrumental um, readiness of the government um, uh, which uh, which, which actually uh, through the time progressively uh, was uh, improving actually also the managerial uh, coordination and all capacities and also the capacities for some multi-sectoral multi uh, cooperation and cultivating multi-sectoral approach. Um, and somehow we have been speaking all uh, the same language, you know. In my opinion, it was partnership as a key, yeah. Okay, thank you, Nella. Um, let's see, I think we have a few more questions coming in. Um, one, one question here is about uh, social norms, and particularly in Tanzania, that in order to create a national action plan, there needs to be work on social norm change, and that social norms and gender norms in particular. Um, so the question was about what is the global partnership doing about social norm work vis-a-vis um, -vis national action plans globally. Um, we, we support INSPIRE and one of the um, important uh, strategies of the seven strategies is um, working on social norms and values in communities. And that social norm value change needs to happen from the individual between uh, the interrelationships of individuals at the community level, at the institutional level, particularly when doing a national action plan, bringing everyone on board and helping them understand that violence is something that can be tackled and should be tackled, and then ultimately at the structural level where we have gender inequality. So we're, we're really working on that and supporting um, countries in doing that. Social norm change is difficult, as Tanzania will testify, and any other country that's worked on it. Um, the key is to really work on measuring that change and documenting it so that we can start learning and then elevate the success of that up to the global partnership platform. Um, so thank you for that question and that comment. We have a social worker from the Cameroon um, writing in. And the question is, how can we get involved with UNICEF? And what can we do as um, individuals? Now, I'm not sure what the second part of that question means, but how can we get involved? I, I, I imagine this is a social worker that wants to link up with the UNICEF system. I will pass that to Kirsten. Kirsten? Hello? Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, sorry. Yes, can you just repeat? My connection was poor. Sure. sure, no problem. We have a social worker who um, I believe is working for the government of Cameroon and they're asking how they can get involved with UNICEF or what he um, or she can do as an individual. So what would be the linkages within countries for, for work, social workers who are not actively involved with UNICEF now? I think the key linkages would be to get in touch either with uh, child protection colleagues in the UNICEF offices at the country level or get in touch with the key ministries of uh, social welfare who are, um, you know, responsible or mandated with strengthening the social services UNICEF workforce at the, at the country level. And usually, you know, the UNICEF office obviously works with the key partners at the country level. Super, thank you. All right, well, we've unfortunately um, are at the end of our webinar, and I wanted to thank all the presenters and the organizers of this webinar for joining us, and particularly um, giving um, Howard and the Global Partnership to End Violence um, a chance to be with you and share this exciting work. We can continue this discussion um, on the discussion board of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance website. Um, and I think that there's gonna be one more final wrap-up slide.
if we don't see that slide, I'd like to thank everybody and um, um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, as Kirsten said, happy social work, work or workforce week and continue your good work. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stella.